All right, everybody. Thank you for everybody that's been downloading the Detroit Sports Podcast. To support us, we'd love for you to go check out DetroitSportsPodcast.com. It's the hub for our podcast. You can check out 24-7 online deals. You can save money on car rentals. You can check out the DSP shop. You can buy tickets. Anything at all regarding Detroit sports, you can find at DetroitSportsPodcast.com. It's also the place where you can go to download the Doc and Jock program. Thank you guys for your support. Check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. It's the free and easy way to help us continue to provide great sports content. www.DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Thank you in advance. We appreciate you all. Hey, everybody. This is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listening to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. All I want to know if you got your popcorn ready. Do you got your popcorn ready? I said, are you strong? They said, I'm strong if you strong. And I said, we strong then. I'm a man. I'm 40. Darren McCarty gets his shots in at Quad Lemieux. And look who came all the way out to try to help. Patrick Waugh. Oh, my goodness. You are listening to the Doc and Jock Show on the Detroit Sports Podcast. Doc and Jock, episode 81, ready to deliver. This is the Doc and Jock program on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, my favorite co-host, a guy I got to give a lot of credit to, a guy that decided that, hey, I think we need to add some more content to the network, and he brought on the Motor City Rant one of the key factors to make that sh- that new show happen. Great debut. Good job, cuz. My cousin, Adam the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? What's up, cuz? If I sound like uh, I got my very uh, white voice going on, it's come a little bit underneath the weather here. There's something wrong with me. So just bear with me. I'm going to try to muscle through this and not cough into the mic. I'm glad that you like the Motor City Rant. I think those guys do a good program. Drops every Monday. You can hear it right here on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Uh, Before we go any further, I do have to give a shout out to a a very special friend of mine. Her name's Angelica. You ever meet one of those girls who play really, really innocent, but you know they are totally off the chain? (laughs) Like everything you talk about, she's like, no, 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 no. But like deep in her eyes, she's like, yes, yes, yes. I'm here, baby. I'm ready, baby. No, no. Tell me, tell me all about her. First of all, you, you, you first, never met. You never met. No. Met a girl first like of this. all, how did you forget to give her a shout out where she has to call you out on Facebook? I got wrapped up in whatever we were doing last week. Oh, it was the Joe Johnson news, man. The Joe Johnson news kind of kicked off, and that got me sidetracked. And I'm sports before chicks all day long. It's just kind of how I roll. So I, it just it totally escaped my mind, man. It's what happened. And then but, and then I decide to say, hey, cuz, how could you diss one of our listeners? And then boom, you blast me. Were you jealous? What was that about, bro? No, dude, you're just always creeping. Just, what the hell is that about? Just creeping, dude. Creep, you want- you're creeping on a down low. It's okay. <laughs> it's all, all good. All right, so now do your thing. So, yeah, no, you ever meet a girl who is just, she's to- she just totally about action, but she tells everybody that she's not, and she always plays holier than thou? That's this girl. Like, you can go check her out. If you got an Instagram, go check her out. It's Hey Ange with two Gs. Check her out. You'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And Hey Ange, what's up, girl? Just go check her out, man. I'm telling you. You'll see what I'm talking about. Like, just look in her eyes. Look in her eyes. You'll see it. Mm -hmm. Freak. Okay, so now you're not feeling well, and the doc is sitting here pissed. You want to know why I'm in a foul mood? Tell me what's up, dude. Okay, what is this? This is your therapy session. What is this? Let's bring the band back together in 2015. Three of the four major teams brought back guys that you really would look to say, why? The Red Wings brought back Dan Cleary this year. Why? Why? Guys played like three games all season, but go ahead, yeah. Earlier this week, the Pistons traded for Tayshawn Prince. Your boy. 34 years old, at the downside of his career, already making noise, chirping because he thought he was going to get bought out, potentially could go to the Clippers and end his career on a winning team. He's long, ling, and freckled. It's all good, dude. (laughs) 
Tayshon, a lot of people around town in the media are like, man, we got to cover this guy. His comments are so monotone and boring. And, you know, I, th I think he's going to be a good teammate. He's going to be a good fit. But why? Really? You got rid of Kyle Singler for Tayshon Prince. Uh, you, you, I would have just, just, you know what? I know you had to include Kyle Singler in order to get Reggie Jackson, but the whole Tayshon thing is just, ugh. And then earlier this week, the Tigers. I, you know, Tuesday morning, I'm excited to wake up, check the Twitter feed, see what's going on. And one of our loyal followers tweets out, Jabba's back for another year. Jabba Chamberlain back for with the Tigers. A Does this one really year upset you? Yes. Why? It's low I, risk, low impact. I know. And he had a really good first half. Dude, I'm going to cut you off here. I'm sorry. He had a really good first half. I mean, his second half, he was a human gas can, but he had a good first half. And you got to remember, too, he's coming off, I think he had Tommy John surgery. And usually you're not right for another year or two after you have that surgery. So I expect a good good season, and it's low risk, high reward. Okay, because do you remember how the fans treated Jabba Chamberlain, Soria, and Nathan when they came back down to Comerica Park after blowing the games in Baltimore? The fans were livid, booing loudly. Jabba Chamberlain and Phil Coke were guys that you, you brought in last year. It just didn't work out. And so you're going to try. I know he's only signed for $1 million. But seriously, Jabba Chamberlain, what does he provide you? I mean, he's a guy that his fastball can be erratic. His sl his slider slash curveball, that's a pitch that he relies on heavily. Is it an out pitch? His stuff is hittable. And we need right now, right now this bullpen is, is one of those situations where they're going to try so many different guys and they're throwing anything against the wall to see what sticks. I just thought that it would have been just beneficial to go away from Jabba Chamberlain. I understand if he stinks, you only lost a million dollars, and they made this move because, by all accounts, Joel Hanrahan is not doing well at the early start of uh, spring training. But Jabba Chamberlain, I would have just rather just left him where he was and not brought him back. I'm just deal, disappointing. Man. It makes me upset and frustrated because I don't think he provides an upgrade, and I, I feel like it's just a waste of a million dollars. Here's the deal. So you go out, you sign a guy like Miguel Cabrera, and you're going to give him a, ch a huge chunk of change. You got Justin Verlander, you're going to give him a huge chunk of change. Reports are circulating now that David Price and the Tigers are trying to work out a long-term deal. All right, so you're going to give him a huge chunk of change. You signed VMart for the next four years, and you're giving him a healthy load of money. So you just sit there and you dole out all this payroll to like your top five guys. You got to sit there and you got to try to piecemeal that bullpen together with $1 million players, man. $750,000 dudes. That's all you can get, man. You go down to the local freaking field and you sit there and you're like, hey, who can throw who can throw a baseball? Can you get it over the plate? If you can get it over the plate, come on. We're going to bring you down to spring training and try you out. So for you, you're not as upset as I am. No, because I'm, my, my hope is that he comes off of his Tommy John surgery two years removed and he's more effective. You see what you've seen that first half of the year instead of what you've seen the second half of the year. Because I think come the second half of the year, his arm was tired, he was tired, and it was all just kind of a buildup of the surgery that he had a year, a year and a half prior. <laughs> okay, so if Dave Dombrowski gets a pass, but if he brings back... Dave um, Dombrowski gets no passes <laughs> because we have a garbage <laughs> bullpen. <laughs> It's if a dumpster it, fire. If, if he brings back Joaquin Benoit or uh, Jose Veras, then we'll have some issues. But, yes. But what about Phil Coke? Does he stay unsigned for the rest of the year, you think? Yes, nobody wants that guy. <laughs> the only time, you know what? This is exactly what will happen. I know it. This is just the Tiger's luck. There's going to be a huge injury. Like, Bruce Rondon's arm's going to fall off. He's going to go out there to pitch in, like, the ninth inning of game three of the season. He's going to go to throw the ball, and just like walking dead, his arm's going to go flying off and hit Alex Avila. He'll have a concussion, so we'll have to go get a catcher, bring him in. Bruce Rondon's leaking blood everywhere. You got to go out and you got to sign Phil Coke. You bring in another lefty to fill out the rest of your bullpen. That's what's going to happen. Mark it down. Game three. Game three. The Rondon zone loses his arm. Avila's got a concussion, and we're bringing Coke back in. <laughs> and then uh, just real quickly, if I hear Alex Avila batting number two again on the radio or in the newspaper, I'm going to go ape shit, man. I don't think, you know, I know they only want to do it versus right-handed batters, but dude is almost an automatic out. He does get... A few clutch hits now and then. His home runs tend to be timely, but if he's and if <laughs> if he ends up as a consistent number two batter, I don't know how much I can watch. I'll be livid. I don't think I can handle that. You know, Alex Avila in the I number know, two spot. I know. That's got to be a guy that's got to get on base. It's got to be the the guy that keeps the inning going. Should the leadoff man get on? This is Alex this Avila is the thing. This hits the out thing. too much. He does get out too much, and a lot of times he is an automatic out. But the guy can hit a fastball, right? And if you're batting in front of Miguel Cabrera, you're going to see a lot of fastballs. On top of it, he's got, against right-handed hitters, I think he's like on-base percentage is above 350, which is solid. 
he doesn't run the bases well because he just kind of moves around like a slug. And half the time I think he's confused because he's had so many damn concussions. But I think he'll be okay versus the righties because his on-base percentage is, is so high. He'll get on base. All, all he has to do is just get on base or move a guy over a little bit. That's all he's got to do. I think that won't be as detrimental as you're thinking it's going to be. I think it might work out okay just because his on-base percentage is, is where it's at. If he can continue that and he can hit a fastball, put it in play, move a runner over, get yourself to first, I think it'll be okay. Maybe I'll, I'll pump the brakes and relax a little bit. But, but just let's get into let's get into uh, our spring training real quick and let's see what happens. Okay. Don't 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 hang uh, Brad Osmus up by his coattails yet. Just oh. give him a second. Cause this podcast is slam packed. We're gonna have a chance to chat with Kai Carlin from the Detroit Sports Nation. Lots of news made Detroit last Sports week. Nation. What, what? Detroit Sports Nation. They're doing great things over there, and we're just glad to be part of it. We're glad to collaborate with them. Um, the Pistons made a lot of news at the trade deadline. Stan Van Gundy, balling, brought in uh, Reggie Jackson, potential future point guard for this team long term. And the Pistons right now are playing a good brand of basketball again. Great wins versus Chicago and Washington last weekend. And the Palace might be a rockin' should they um, continue this hot streak. So we want to get some insight from Kai Carlin at the Detroit Sports Nation. We are going to play a round of The Doctor is in Session. The Jock has three great questions lined up regarding sports news locally and nationally, and the Doc is always ready to deliver and bring the noise. To end the podcast, we got to talk a little bit about the Red Wings, a little bit concerning the game versus Anaheim. I think that uh, actually... There's been a concern now the last couple of games in terms of holding leads, the play at goaltender we have to review, and we got to look at some potential moves that they could make and what should the Red Wings do going forward because the trade deadline is approaching. We got to get a chance to um, look at how the Red Wings shape up. Should they be buyers? Should they be a team that uh, potentially make a big move? So lots of interesting stuff going on with the Tigers, Pistons, and Wings, and I'm ready to cover it all. You ready to hit this bad boy off? I'm ready. I just want to make an announcement too before everybody hears all this and before people start chirping at us on Twitter. I know my voice sounds like two cats fucking. I understand. (laughs) I know where I'm at. It's horrible, and I'm sorry. Just bear with me, and we'll try to get through this, and I know it's going to be a little bit painful, but uh, just bear with me. Okay, we're going to have Kai Carlin. Um, Let's take a quick break. We'll have Kai Carlin on after the break, and we'll get a chance to break down the week that was for the Detroit Pistons. Stay with us. Definitely check out the guys at the Detroit Sports Nation, DetroitSportsNation.com. Great website. They are unbelievable. They are killing it on Facebook. Give them a like at their Facebook page, Detroit Sports Nation, and definitely check out their website, DetroitSportsNation.com. Our collaboration with them has been excellent, and they continue to be a strong presence here on the podcast because they bring the noise and they have great content. So thank you guys again. We can't thank you enough. You're the future of our business, and I know when you guys have a podcast like this, our future is in good hands. you got to check out their stuff. I mean, I'm really impressed by it. You guys have probably one of the better ones I've seen in the country. Wow. In a short period of time, you've done good work. Look at me kissing your head. <laughs> I know. It's the On the line with us, Kai Carlin. He is a writer, covers the Pistons for DetroitSportsNation.com. Kai, good afternoon, my friend. What's going on? I'm good, sir. How are you? Everything's good, man. The Pistons, a lot of us thought that the season was over when Brandon Jennings tore his Achilles, but Stan the Man is not, um, he's not standing pat and made some great moves at the trade deadline, bringing in Reggie Jackson, bringing back Tayshaun Prince. What was your reaction to the moves at the trade deadline? Honestly, I was surprised when they brought when they made a move at all. I mean, uh, I thought they were going to move forward. T.J. Austin's team, it just didn't really seem like Dan Van Gundy was the guy to make a move. Personally, I thought getting rid of Kyle Singler is probably one of their better moves. I mean, I, I'm not, I was never really a big fan of Kyle Singler, especially him starting. Now, you, you kind of bring in a guy who can actually start this league, a guy who can defend other small forwards. And also, as soon as we go to Reggie Jackson, Reggie Jackson is a gamer. Reggie Jackson did a terrific job filling in for Russell Westbrook early in the year. Averaged 20-7 and seven as a starter this year for OKC. Now, moving forward, what does that mean for next year? As far as Reggie Jackson and Brandon Jennings go, we'll have to see. But for this season, I think you can book it. This is going to the playoffs this year. Kai, do you think the two, Brandon Jennings and Reggie Jackson, are going to be able to coexist? Do you see this working in the locker room? 
I don't know. That remains to be seen. I think moving forward, I think for these final 25, 26 games that Sam Van Gundy has, Reggie Jackson, I think he has to look at what he has and then kind of make a decision from there. Look at what he has in Jackson, and then if he likes what he sees in Jackson, then shot Brandon Jennings in the offseason. I mean, that's what I would do. All right, if these two come back next season, whose team is this going to be? Because before Brandon Jennings got hurt, he took a real leadership role in that locker room in – he commanded the respect of everybody in that room, and he was doing really good things and helped them get out to that huge win streak that they got and kind of got them back into the playoff contention. And now Reggie Jackson comes in, and now you're sliding him in, in as your number one point guard. So whose team is this going to be if they both come back next season? If they both come back next year, it's Brandon Jennings' team. If they both come back next year, it's Brandon Jennings' team. Jennings was there longer. Jennings knows the offense probably a little bit better. Jennings knows the teammates a little bit better. There's no question it's Brandon Jennings' team. Not, not a question. All right, do you think uh, Tayshaun Prince is going to be a malcontent? Earlier this week, he had some, uh, I wouldn't really say that they were a real heartwarming press conference with no. the media and didn't really come out and really give a real big thumbs up to being a Piston again. Well, no, come on. You guys know, you guys know that. Tayshaun Prince wasn't mad at the Pistons currently. He's mad at the Boston Celtics because he believed that he was getting ready to be bought, either bought out or he was going to be kept with the Celtics throughout the rest of the season. He had no idea he was going to get traded. He's a veteran in this league. He, he, he thinks he deserves a little more respect. They lied to him. The Celtics organization lied to him, saying, we're going to keep you or buy you out, but then we're going to trade you. Also, he kind of has ill will towards Joe Dumars, who traded him in 2013 to Memphis without any forewarning, without coming to him either. He's just he's a little disrespected. But coming back here now, he loves the city of Detroit. He loves the Pistons organization. He's wearing his number 22. Listen, Tayshawn Prince isn't an issue. Like, that, that, that whole thing, that's a big media blow up. Kai, what's your opinion been of KCP now? A lot of fans, when he was drafted, were obviously disappointed, wanted potentially Trey Burke, a hometown guy. But what's your thoughts been on KCP and his development? And, you know, when he's hot, he's a player that can make some things happen for the Pistons. Well, I personally believe that Kentavious Caldwell Pope can be that guy who can the best two way player the Pistons have seen in a while. I mean, the guy the guy gets into it defensively. I mean, he held James Harden, who is an MVP candidate this year, kinda held him, kinda at least contained him a little bit. And not only that, the other ready scored twenty eight points. He was all he was all over the all over the floor, knocking down threes. He's all he did on Sunday against Washington. He looked like he had a good chemistry there with Reggie Jackson. I'm a real big believer in KCP because there's a difference here. KCP comes out and gives 100 percent each and every night. So that, that's a big thing there. Fans don't realize that. I mean, you can have an off night, but as long as you're giving me 100 percent effort, I'll take it. A, a talking point among fans, among he, um, among the media here in Detroit, will be the contract of Greg Monroe when he enters free agency. Do you think he tests free agency, and do you think that he'll be a Piston next year? Of course, he tests free agency. Who would? But um, I do think he comes back next year. He has that strong relationship with Andre Drummond, so I don't think Drummond's going to let him go. <laughs> He's, Drummond will do everything in his power to keep him here. I think Brandon Jennings will do the same thing. What the Pistons do with Greg Monroe moving forward, because Reggie Jackson is a free agent as well. So, I mean, Jack is probably going to want max money. We know Monroe wants max money. Dan Van Gundy is going to have, you know, a little issue there, but I think he'll figure it out. I think maybe I think Monroe will definitely be back next year. That's definitely. Okay, now you said you – a little bit bold. You said the Pistons will make the playoffs. Do you think if they get to the playoffs, they can make some noise, or will this be a learning experience and they'll get, uh, you know, no higher than the eighth seed? It's a learning experience. Think about it. They they get the eighth seed. Go to play Atlanta. Atlanta beat them three times already, and all of them have been by double digits. Well, I, I actually accept that thing for Martin with the King Day, but Atlanta will beat them in four or five. The same thing with Toronto. I mean, I think Toronto is a bad matchup for Detroit. Uh, Toronto's a lot more athletic. They're younger. They run up the floor. Uh, Valanciunas always gives Drummond and Monroe issues. So, I mean, they're not getting higher than a, than a seventh seed if they get in. So, I mean, their most likely opponent is to be Atlanta, Toronto. And even if LeBron, James, and the Cavs get up there, do the, you think they're going to be LeBron in seven-game series this year? Probably not. So, not this year. This year's an, a learning experience. But next year is when you're going to start seeing this team actually move up in standing. Now, news broke a little bit, and I think I read it on uh, Detroit Sports Nation as well. Back in 2007, the Pistons made overtures and tried to trade for Kobe Bryant, but he nixed the deal. With Kobe Bryant, do you think the Pistons have that fall, or do you think that he would have continued to you know, be a guy that on this Piston team that took all the shots and would have been a terrible piece for the Pistons? What would have happened had the Pistons traded for Kobe Bryant and it went through back in 2007, in your opinion? Tough to say. It's definitely tough to say about Kobe Bryant. I was, I'm, he brings such a competitive edge that maybe he, he – who knows? He probably rubs guys the wrong way. I mean, he rubs guys the wrong way in Los Angeles. 
I think the guys in Detroit would have appreciated his competitiveness and everything because, you know, Detroit were all about hard work and everything. But I look at Kobe Bryant, and sometimes he just he rubs guys the wrong way. You know, maybe he messed up the chemistry that year. It's definitely tough to say. Yeah, and I think it's it's so difficult because I think what we would need on this team is a superstar, a guy that can get his own shot, that in crunch time can take over and help this team get over the edge. But the Pistons kind of work in the whole teamwork model and things like that, hard work on defense. But I just think that if the Pistons would have had Kobe Bryant, I don't think they would have fallen off. I think they would have been a playoff team. But I just think that uh, I don't think he would have fit in here. I just think that he would have probably been a guy that took all the shots. It might have been difficult. We might have not had great success, but it would have been a situation. It would have been, it would have been fun to go to the Palace night in, night out, see a guy that could, could potentially get you 30 to 40 points a night. But in terms of team success, yeah, it sounds like he's a guy that's all about me and is really tough as a teammate. He's very demanding. A lot of guys don't want to play with him. It's crazy, huh? Exactly. That's a big thing. I mean, he, he drove Dwight Howard out of L.A. because Dwight Howard couldn't deal with, you know, Kobe's competitiveness. And to, to a lesser extent, you can make the case, you know, that um, Kyle Gasol wanted out. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, it, there, there's no use talking about it now. I kind of brushed it off as a non-issue. I mean, Kobe Bryant here would have been great. But I don't think anything would change. Remember that team with the six straight Eastern Conference Finals. You know, there was really nothing to mess with. All right, talk about what you've seen the last couple of games. You've we've seen now the Pistons have surprising wins over the Bulls and Wizards. What what have you seen in the last couple of games that uh, has impressed you? I think in the Chicago game, you got to look at what rookie Spencer Dinwiddie did. Dinwiddie went for twelve points, nine assists, and he pretty much took went toe to toe with Derrick Rose. Had better numbers than Derrick Rose. Karan Butler scoring twenty. Greg Monroe giving you twenty. Drummond giving you eighteen and twenty. It's a total team effort. But the one thing I really stood out to me was Spencer Dinwiddie against Chicago. And against Washington, Reggie Jackson stepping up in the second half. Absolutely. Got to be Reggie Jackson. How much more magic does Stan Van Gundy got in the hat? I mean, you talked about the move with Spencer Dinwiddie. You see what he's doing with this team. When he came in, this team was bad. We all knew this team was bad. And he's now got them to a level where we're talking about playoffs and possibly being a seven seed. How much more magic do you see Stan Van Gundy having in his hat? Uh, Stan Van Gundy, I think you got to give him a ton of credit because remember Detroit was five and twenty-three. I mean, all of a sudden he releases the Malcolm Fenton and, and Josh Smith, and he's really changed the culture in Detroit. Remember, when you think of the Pistons, you kind of thought of a team that sucks, losing records, bad attitudes. Every now, when you watch a game, there's a different feel around the team, and I think Stan Van Gundy can keep it going. I've said it before, Stan Van Gundy knows basketball. So if you look at the Pistons, he's done a terrific job, amazing job. And I think he can keep this going. Kai Carlin from DetroitSportsNation.com. Thanks for the few minutes this evening, and uh, be well. And uh, what do you got upcoming? You said you're going to, uh, when I asked for, to chat with you, you said you're going to be covering a game tonight. What do you got going on? Uh, tonight, we're going to be broadcasting some Stockton basketball over here in uh, Callaway, New Jersey. I'm, uh, I'm going to be down here broadcasting some college D3 basketball. So I'm going to take care of that tonight. All right, Kai. Be well. Thanks for your insight regarding the Detroit Pistons. Kai Carlin, check them out, DetroitSportsNation.com. Thanks, Kai. Thanks, Kai. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Kai Carlin bringing the noise, talking about that kid loves him some basketball. You can just tell. You, <laughs> he, you can throw anything at him. He loves basketball. He's always you know, a great presence on the Facebook. Check him out and DetroitSportsNation.com. All right, because after the break, we are going to play a round of the doctors in session. Jock will try and bear with his throat and his nasally sick voice and pump out three questions, and the doc will carry the segment. Hopefully, stay with us. If you're a fan of Michigan, cuz, then you have to check out uofmdiehards.com. Check them out on Twitter. Check out their Facebook page. They are a page that's dedicated to all things University of Michigan. They follow every game. They follow recruits. They have great interviews, uofmdiehards.com. Doc and Jock, check out that website quite a bit. If you're a fan of Michigan, there's no better website to check out than uofmdiehards.com. I'm go blue, baby. This is the Detroit Pistons Dancing Usher. My name is Shannon. And when I'm not at the palace, I'm listening to Detroit Sports Podcast. Log in, listen in, have some fun with us. Love this group. Love the station. You ain't gotta say too much. Hate when you say that I play too much. When I get too close, I'ma touch that subject. I can read your body. No set. Quit all that yapping. Need less talk and a little more action. Yeah. Now, girl, keep it G. Know you speak a little freak. I can hear it in your accent. 
said, tell me, can you understand my language? If you try and ride, just stay in my lane. There's no other way to explain it in layman. All right, back episode 81, Detroit Sports Podcast. Thanks for everyone that's been supporting us. The free and easy way to support our project here, simple. Go to the website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Free and easy way. Check out the website. You can get both shows from the website. You can check out lots of great deals. If you're an online shopper, why pay full price? We got discounts with all the major online websites. So check us out, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. And if you like what you hear, become a contributor. One dollar a month keeps everything rolling, helps keep our operation in check. Both shows are rolling, lots of downloads. So we greatly appreciate the support. We never want to forget those who support us, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. All right, cuz, you ready for another round of The Doctor Is In Session? Dude, are you ready for another round of The Doctor Is In Session? Let's do this. But to be the man, you got to beat the man. And I'm saying, woo, right here, I'm the man. Woo! All right, dude. So I need you to put your GM hat on. You're going to pretend to be the uh, Lions GM, Martin Mayhew. And the cap is what the cap is. You're going to cut Reggie Bush. In this case, to help fill that backfield, would you go after a running back like a D'Angelo Williams or try to get a guy like Adrian Peterson, whose agent has recently told the Vikings that he refuses to play for them again, according to reports? (laughs) All right, cuz. How much cold medicine have you taken that you're presenting me the option of two guys who are who are old? <laughs> now, I'm going to answer your question. It's a legit question because they're both available. But my thinking is the Lions are going to go young. They better not. They better not draft Melvin Gordon in the, with that 23rd pick because you can get value at lower rounds because, you dude, know. Plus, plus, dude, you got you got the Australian rules football guy coming in. I have, He's got a competitive 40. Now. All props to uh, Langford at, uh, from Michigan State who blew it up at the uh, Combine and Trey Wayne's Michigan State guys. Speed, talent, they were impressive. The state guys were impressive. And then you got some morons out there who are saying that Michigan State's not one of the teams that's on the rise. Why? Because Ohio State and Michigan with that perception? Psh, give me a break. Michigan State players did well at the Combine and they represented. But back to the Lions, I think of these two players, obviously you would want Adrian Peterson. You just hide the kids, keep them away from Adrian Peterson, let him focus on football. As long as he's not focused on parenting, I'm all good with it. He's a great guy. I don't think, though, he's going to end up in Detroit. I think that he'll end up back with Minnesota. He's going to just have to have some tough talks uh, with the Vikings organization. The organization will need to mend some fences regarding what happened when the news broke that he was disciplining his kids a little bit rough. Now, D'Angelo Williams, I like but he's, he's a player nine years into the league Dude, already. you love him. You draft him every year in the fantasy league. You, you want to know why? D'Angelo, and I don't understand why, because the guy's always breaking down. He is always breaking down, but he's part of a tandem with Jonathan, with Jonathan Stewart, who's always hurt too. So there are some games. When D'Angelo Williams is featured, he's a guy that can do some damage. He's got some breakaway speed. He's got the ability to get to the house, and he's a competitive guy. He's a guy like Steve Smith, ultra competitive. He's got talent, and if you see... Around the time um, when when a lot of players are breaking down and not with it, he steps up. So he's there in crunch time, but yeah, he is injury prone. And so that's why this is a tough question because they're both older guys. And, you know, DeMarco Murray's also in that list, a guy that's available, but can't with, afford with, him. Yeah, with some miles on him and you can't afford him. So of the two, I would take Adrian Peterson, but I don't think you have an option with either. They, if it's up to me, if I'm playing, if I'm playing pro, uh, prognosticator, I think that the Lions will address the running game and running backs in the 2015 draft. Go young. Yeah, it's time to part ways with Reggie Bush and get younger at that position, and let's get the guy similar to Le'Veon Bell. Once, I'm putting it out there, the Lions will draft a running back in the later rounds, and I think that he'll be the guy, whoever it may be. Maybe he won't be heralded, but I think this is the year we get that unheralded guy. I think this is the year, because I'm going to put it out there, positive thinking. This is the year. We draft an unheralded guy that maybe no one's heard of, and he becomes a star. Let's hope. Somebody else got my codeine cold medicine. Codeine, baby. All right. So Miguel Cabrera has reported to training camp with the Tigers, and by all accounts, looks much leaner and looks great. Looks like he's in really good shape. He was out there bouncing around down uh, Lakeland, and everybody was just sitting there raving about him. 
what percentage do you believe he will be when he steps into the batter's box to take his first at bat on April 6th? Now, cuz, should I be a little bit cynical? When I first saw Miguel Cabrera on the footage, I was like, whoa, somebody's been off of the juice. Because, yes, it's understandable he got hurt, so he wasn't lifting as much. But did I look at it a little too closely? Am I being overly critical? But did he need to look a little bit too thin, in my opinion? He looked like he's, you know, maybe changing up his workout routine or he's not uh, doing as much lifting in his old age. But from my point of view, looked like looked like he stopped taking something <laughs> to lose that much weight. You remember about like three, four years ago when he had to go back to play third base? You remember how much weight he lost that one off season? Yeah. And then every off season after that, he's kind of trimmed up a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. You're right. It is dramatic. The amount and, and, of weight that he lost. And but think, I don't think he's off anything. I think he's just taking better care of himself. And I think he put, because he knew that he wasn't going to be able to be on his ankle, wasn't going to be able to jump or run, I think he really took into account that, kind of watched what he ate and really monitored his diet and and did what he could do inside the gym that yeah. didn't involve putting a lot of pressure yeah, on his but, Yeah, because my thinking is in order to lose that much weight, you got to be doing a lot more cardio. But, you know, I know that he had surgery. So, you know, did, did the lack of uh, pharmaceuticals aid in his uh, weight loss and, and his appearance? I doubt it, but when he first came out, it was a surprising look. So what percentage do I think he'll be at? I think he'll be at between 85 and 90%. I think that they're going to monitor him during the this month. He will have a chance to, you know, get at bats later on in spring training, but early on, he'll be a bystander, you know, get one or two at bats a game, and he'll, he'll be given the chance to heal properly. I like how the Tigers organization handles players who are injured. I mean, Victor Martinez gets injured often in off-season workouts, but he's come back and done well. You would think that, okay, you've hurt your leg in one off-season, and then in another off-season you hurt yourself. You know, you got to think about your workout routines in order to avoid these injuries because we need them, especially now. And this is his first year. Uh, this is his first year in a new contract. So Miguel Cabrera will be 85 to 90 percent when the season starts, and I'm hoping that he can get off to a hot start because we're going to need him. I think a lot of games early are going to be very, very interesting and very tight. And may, this is going to be a great season to watch our Detroit Tigers. But Miguel Cabrera needs to definitely step up, and we need him to be as close to 100% when the postseason rolls around. Just get him to 100% at the postseason. Please, Tigers. All right, so I'm taking your GM hat off, and I'm putting your trader cap on. I got you dumped down in the middle of New York, and you're on the stock exchange. Who are you putting all your money on? The hot new stock, the Detroit Pistons, who look like they have a ton of value and a lot of potential going forward, or the blue chipper, the Detroit Red Wings, who are going to make another playoff run, haven't missed the playoffs in 24 years, and are looking to do a ton of business here. Who are you putting your money on? Right now, the rising stock is the Pistons. They're playing great basketball. The They have new additions, so we got some new pieces. And Stan Van Gundy is a coach that something's with him. He's, he's, got, he's got that magic. He's got that it factor in terms of his coaching ability, his ability to get guys to buy into his system to buy in quickly. The Red Wings, I'm a little bit worried because the biggest position, and we're going to talk about it later, one of the key positions in all of Detroit sports, the goaltending position, has been a little bit shaky lately. And with a shaky goaltender, with someone who's coming off of an injury, you always have to question, how far can this team go? And the Eastern Conference playoff-wise, wow, what a difficult situation it's going to be if we're going to have to play Tampa Bay, Montreal, Philadelphia, the Islanders. It's going to be tough to get out of the Eastern Conference. The Red Wings may have to play a lot of six and seven game series. And these guys, so far so good, have been relatively injury free. Zetterberg has been out recently with it with the upper body injury, Howard with the groin. But relatively speaking, a lot of players have been injury free. Can this team hold up? I'm thinking there's a potential because this team is young. They have playoff experience, but they don't have a lot of playoff experience. They don't have a lot of playoff success. You got to remember, Jimmy Howard is in his ninth season with the Red Wings. Can this team, can the Red Wings continue with the scoring in the playoffs when it's crunch time? The last couple years, based on what we've watched and observed, when things get tight, that's when the scoring issues happen. That's when Jimmy Howard makes some key mistakes, and I'm not even sure Jimmy Howard will be the goaltender. You remember, cuz, we had Dominic Hasek, and he started that series versus Nashville. Didn't finish it. Chris Osgood took over. Now, I just wish Mrazek was a little bit older. I don't think Mike Babcock can turn to Peter Mrazek and say, hey, lead this team to the playoffs. You got the monster, dude. That's who's going to go in there. If something bad happens with uh, Howard, you got the monster. 
Yeah, I, he's huge. He's a big man. He's a big dude, but you know, does he have a lot of playoff success and experience? Not really. So that's the tough part is that you can't you can say that he's a serviceable backup in the regular season, but can he take his game to the next level, which a goaltender needs to do? Can Jimmy Howard or the monster take his game to to a level like Jonathan Quick to a Carey Price? Uh, I kind of think that the reason why I'm a little bit weary of the wings is they are what they are. And Jimmy Howard has yet to show me he can take his game to that next, next level where he's unstoppable. He's, but I'm not trying to be, you know, overly critical. He's a, a, a B plus goaltender. He's better than over half the goalies in the league. But now I'm talking about the elite of goaltending. He's not in that category. And that makes me question how far this team can go. The Pistons, a team that can get hot shooting, you got to be fearful of. And I know Kai earlier said that he'd be fearful playing Atlanta. Atlanta's not world beaters. They don't have a lot of experience in the playoffs making runs. And how will they handle being a number one seed with all that pressure? A team like the Pistons, if they get hot, you got Reggie Jackson, KCP, Meeks, Karam Butler. You got guys that if they get hot can put up a bunch of points quickly. And those are the kind of teams that can get hot and can make some noise in the playoffs. So what's going to happen? I think in the end, the Wings will be probably a team that wins one or two series and the Pistons will most likely end their season probably in the first round if they make the playoffs. Who has the more potential? The Pistons, in my opinion. Really? Pistons. Buy the Pistons. Sell on the Red Wings. Sell, sell, sell. You're selling on a team who's guaranteed to make a playoff spot for a team who might make a playoff spot? You got to remember, goaltending and defense with one significant injury could put this team in a one-and-done situation, especially in the East. That's true, but the Pistons are looking at maybe a 7 or 8 seed, and you're going up against the likes of a Toronto or an Atlanta? Like I, like I said, my point was shooting, and you got Greg Monroe, and you got if the Pistons, their biggest weakness is defense, if in the next 20 games can sure up their defense with their defensive intensity rebounding, look out for them. They can make some noise. They can upset a one or two seed. Either way, it's a good spot to be in if you're a Detroit fan. Good times. Whether you like the Pistons or you like the Wings. Both look like they're going to the playoffs, so... That's all you can ask for. Good job, Doc. Nice you know work. It. I have been pleasantly enjoying Detroit sports lately, trying not to be too harsh, too critical. Lots of good topics, lots of interesting news and pointers and tidbits that's come out in the last couple of weeks. So it'd be very interesting to see how things progress with all our teams going forward. All right, stay with us. After the break, we are going to talk about more in-depthly the Red Wings, where they go from here, where they go in the future, a look at the trade deadline situation, what targets we could get, should the Red Wings go out and make a major move? Stay with us. If you're a fan of tennis and you're a fan of mixed doubles, there's a great mixed doubles tennis tournament coming to the Gross Point Hunt and Tennis Club the first week of March, March 3rd through the 8th. You can get up close and personal and watch great mixed doubles tennis action at the Gross Point Hunt and Tennis Club. Check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Click through the sponsor banner. Check out the details regarding the Mixed Doubles Tennis Tournament. You can watch great professional Mixed Doubles action with great seating. Support those who support us. It's always a good time. Check it out. You can't really get a better seat if you're a fan of tennis. Doc and Jock most likely will be there if the Jock survives and uh, doesn't get too too ill. We should be there supporting the tennis tournament. I'm a big tennis fan. I'm a big tennis guy. So don't miss out on the Mixed Doubles Championships over there at the Gross Point Hunt and Tennis Club. All right, Jock. On a rare occasion, I get a chance to stay up, quiet, relax, and watch a great Red Wings hockey game. So I'm excited. Pavel Datsuk versus Anaheim is going off, scores two goals in three minutes. The Red Wings with tic-tac-toe passing in the first two periods, they're dominating. They're playing great hockey, exciting. You're like, okay, can I? should I turn it off? I'm like, okay, no, it's a little bit late, but I'm going to stay up and enjoy the rest of the game. And what happens? In the third period, the Red Wings fall apart. They give up three goals in a short period of time. A couple of them were bad goals, and Mike Babcock pointed it out. Pucks went in the net that, that, that shouldn't. You can tell because teams are shooting high on Jimmy Howard because they know. They listen to the Doc and Jock program. They know that Jimmy Howard's puck control is not that great. Give up rebounds, and the puck went in the net. 3-3 three, three goes to overtime, and of course, when things go to the shootout, Jimmy Howard just is not the best at it. And the Red Wings lost a tough game to Anaheim 4-3 to three in the shootout. Again, a lot of the Boo Birds are out regarding Jimmy Howard. His play the last couple games has not been great, and it's been concerning. A guy that's got a long-term deal, 
it's tough to evaluate because he is coming off of an injury. He was playing well earlier in the season. So just your opinion, Jimmy Howard, his play of late, should we be concerned? Is it time to jump off of the bandwagon or is it time to uh, kick back, relax, let Jimmy Howard work his way through this, uh, this, this rough stretch? I don't think you relax. He's shown flashes of greatness. There was a game against Chicago where he looked outstanding. And then there are games like the Anaheim game where he just gives up weird, weak goals. And there's games like the Dallas game where he gave up a bunch of goals too. And I actually on, on that Saturday night, got into a huge debate with a buddy of mine who plays goalie. So he knows the ropes, right? And me and him got into it. And my point to him was he is the cause of a lot of these goals that are going in. It's not like the defense didn't help, but he's the, he's the reason for it. He plays bad positional hockey a lot of times, and he gets what himself the hell is in that trouble. About? This is what it's about. He plays bad positional hockey, and then he gives up huge rebounds, and that gets him in trouble too because he'll make the initial save, but he'll be out of position to come back to to help clean up that rebound, and then the puck's deposited in the back of the net. And this has been this is the point I was trying to make the other day. This has been a problem with him throughout his career. This is something that I don't think is going to change. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it at this point. You have to support him. He's your number one goalie. You pay him like he's a number one goalie. I think that he is a top 12 goalie in the league. I by no means think he's a top five goaltender, though. And I think he has subtle things that he needs to work on to become a better goaltender. But I don't see him doing that. I don't see him putting that work in, into working on those issues. And I know they have a positional coach. And I know they have a coach who goes through you know, where you should put your rebounds and how you should kick your pads out and what you got to do. But I just don't see those things translating during the game. I see those things being the what hamstrings the wings and why they have to go out and have to put seven pucks in a net to win a game. More of the blame, should it go to the defense? Because the defense, when you watch the game versus Anaheim, they were great in the first two periods. They were aggressive. They were getting the pucks out of the zone faster. But it seemed like once the rush came and Anaheim is a great team, they are a team that can put the puck in the net. They can get hot quickly. Once they got the momentum, it seemed like the Red Wings defense kind of backed off. They weren't as, as aggressive. They were backed up in their own zone. Who was more to blame in that game versus Anaheim? Was it Jimmy Howard or was it the defense? I think there's equal blame. It's got to go around equally. As a defenseman, you've got your own responsibilities and you have to do what you've got to do. And if the goalie makes the initial save, you've got to sit there and you've got to either tie the guy up so he doesn't get that second shot or you got to help him clear that puck. You as the goaltender, though, you've got to corral that rebound and you know where you got to know where you're putting it. And you got to be in position to make that save. And there's just too many times where Jimmy Howard is blocking the shot and kicking it out. And when he kicks it out, it goes right to right to the opposing player. Or the defenseman is trying to tie the guy up and the guy gets loose and gets a stick on it. It's just there, there's there's blame that goes around equally. I just think Jimmy Howard, at this point in his career, I'm expecting more. I want more. And I'm not calling for Peter Morazic to be the number one. And I'm not calling for Gustafson to be the number one. It's Jimmy Howard's team. I just need to see more. I want more from Jimmy Howard. I want to see him developing and working on the things that are causing him so many issues and why the Wings are getting beat in games that they should actually be winning. You know, it, there's no reason that you should give up six goals in a game like you did that Saturday night to, to Dallas. There's no reason for that. You're a better team than that. And and you were, you were controlling that game. But there were time and time again, you're laying on your back or you're all the way to one side of the net. You're outside of your crease. And it's just you're 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 reaching, you're stretching, you're leaving open holes. And in the NHL, these guys are so talented, so talented. You could hang a quarter off of a goalpost, and they're gonna pick it off. That's how good these guys are. So you can't leave them time or space, and you can't leave them gaping holes like that. Now, when you you watch the games, you notice um, a big drop off when Mickey Redmond's not there. I got a chance to really enjoy the game growing up. Mickey Redman, great um, color guy. The ultimate homer. Uh, yeah, he's, that's why I like him. He's great. He's got a lot of uh, knowledge of the game, being a former player. But when you watch the game and Chris Osgood's doing it, it just kind of seems to me, and I'll get your opinion if you've maybe noticed this or it's just me, he's kind of monotone. He's kind of like, hey, oh, you know, and he's just kind of, it's one of those situations where I watch the game and I'm thinking, Chris Osgood is, is good. He knows the game, but his presentation on the game makes it rather dull and boring. It's two different dudes. Yeah, you've got a defenseman or a former defenseman. There's something wrong with me. And you've got a goaltender. As a goaltender, your job is always to stay calm, cool. That's why you never really see goaltenders fight. They generally are laid back people. They're calm, cool. They're a little bit different, kind of introverted. As a defenseman, you're always on the aggressive. You always got to protect. You always got to watch out. You always are, 
are trying to figure something out. If you have to, you've got to go punch somebody in the face. Two different dudes, two different positions, two different styles, and they carry that into the broadcast booth. And that's what you're seeing. And that's what you're hearing. Chris Osgood's just a different guy. He's laid back. I don't think he's monotone. I just think he's laid back. It, it, it's like me and you, dude. You're you're more calm. You're more reasonable. I'm generally loud. I'm ready to flip the table over. And sometimes I want to come over and choke you. And you're just like, just just hang out, dude. It's going to be okay. Go sit on the couch. We'll talk about it. And I'm like, I don't want to talk to you. It's just it's how it is, dude. It's how this so works. You're, so you're cool with both guys? You see you see no real difference? You're cool listening to both guys um, who sit next to Ken Daniels doing the games on uh, Fox Sports Detroit? Yeah, it doesn't really bother me. I'll be honest with you. I like some of the insight that they give you from a player perspective. But when I'm watching the game, I'm really watching the game. You know, okay. I, it's it's one of those things. I'm not really... It, it's nice to have the commentary, and it's nice to sometimes gleam a little insight to something. But I'm generally watching the game, and that's the rest of it's just kind of background noise. See, like my 15-year-old uh, pair of underwear. I don't like change. So Mickey Redman doesn't take the trips out west anymore. I don't like change a whole lot. So when Mickey Redmond's not there, I noticed a difference, and I was like, oh, I'm not enjoying this as much. But the game, you're right. The, when the game's good, then who's calling it is not that big of a deal. But I did notice a difference, so I just wanted to bring it up. Point of concern, because one of the big two, Henrik Zetterberg, out the last couple of games due to, quote-unquote, upper body injury. Many believe it has to do with a head injury he suffered um, when he was kind of punched. And he's been out a couple games. How concerned should we be that he may have lingering concussion issues last year, had back issues, getting up there in age? We need the guy to be there and be firing on all cylinders when the playoffs come around. How concerned should we be regarding uh, Henrik Zetterberg and his uh, potential prolonged timeout due to head injury? Good old Jamie Benn taking cheap shots. They're not going to call this a concussion. They don't want to call it a concussion. I'm going to call it a concussion. Dude got popped in the head two or three times by Jamie Benn. Just solid shots right to the face. I watched it from the uh, the Dallas uh, feed, and I watched it from the Wings feed, and I watched it like three or four times. And Z got popped a few times. Like He got hit so hard, he, that's when he went down to the one knee, and he kind of skated off. And even when he was sitting on the bench, he looked like he was dazed and confused. If you've ever had a concussion, it's really weird. Everything is very fuzzy. You're not really sure what's going on. It's it's like everything's a blur to you. It's almost like a dream. So I'm going to call it a concussion. I think he has a concussion. And I think there's a lot of reason to be concerned. I mean, I really feel like, he, for one, he is he was your leading point getter. He's now, uh, he's last I checked, him and uh, Datsuk are like neck and neck right now, leading the team in points. But on top of that, he's probably your best centerman. He's one of your best two-way players that you have. And he is a calming force on this lineup. When something has to get done, he goes out and he'll do it. He's got no problem mucking it up in the corners. He has no problem winning a big time draw. And he has no time scoring, no problem scoring goals with seconds left on the clock. So you're losing a lot of firepower there and you're losing a lot of intangibles that you're now looking at a guy like Riley Shahan to try to pick that up. And as good as Riley Shahan is, I think it's a little young to be lumping some of this on him. And some of this burden is going to have to fall onto other players to kind of step their game up in his absence. So I think this is a huge concern. And the one thing you don't want, because playoffs are right around the corner, you don't want this lingering and going into the playoffs. Because if he's not right for the playoffs, now you're down, like I said, your best centerman. The guy who's going to go out there and win you a faceoff in crunch time. You know, I mean, he's a key part of that. He's a key part of that power play, which is number one in the league. He's a, he's a key player on, on the penalty kill. He does all kinds of great things for this team, and he's an integral member in that locker room. So I think this is a big deal, and I think this has to draw some kind of concern because the playoffs are so close, so close. Speaking of playoffs and the trade deadline, March 2nd, cuz it's that all-important time of year, an exciting time for Red Wings fans. It harkens back to when there was no salary cap. Ken Holland could just pick and choose the hot young player and bring him in. Remember when he brought in Brendan Shanahan, made that push in 97, bam, and it kicked off a great stretch of Red Wings hockey. Now, in a salary cap era, it makes things a lot more challenging. But right now, the issue is going to be this. The challenge for the Red Wings making a trade with another organization is a lot of other teams are going to ask for a lot because the Red Wings have a wealth of talent in the minors and have a wealth of talent on the active roster. Do you think this team is going to make a big move on March 2nd, knowing that a lot of teams may ask for a Mantha, a Polkanen, or a Tatar, your big guns, in order to, and like you've said on earlier podcasts, in order to get something, you have to give up something. Do the Wings take that chance, roll the dice, giving away a young player for a piece that could potentially help them get over the hump. 
Ken Holland has come out and said that the moves that they make at the trade deadline, if any, are not going to be for depth, guys. They're looking to make a blockbuster deal. I think they do. I think they go out and they they target somebody. They give up something to get something, though. And I've got a couple names I'm going to throw at you here, and I'll explain I'll explain kind of where my head's at with it. Cause I got I got about I got four names here that I think could work. So you got Keith Yandel, who's one of the highest scoring defensemen out there in the league right now. He's got a year remaining left on his contract, and he's looking at five point five million dollars in salary. So it's a little bit expensive, and you're going to have to give up something. You're probably going to have to give them up a a defenseman that you have in your minor league system. You know, maybe a Xavier Oldlet, and maybe a, maybe an additional forward, or maybe a draft pick to uh, to the to the to the Coyotes. Now, I don't mind this move. the The salary cap ramifications bother me a little bit. And the reason I say that is they have money to spend, but you don't want to take on that's that's a pretty big contract, and you don't want to take on another large contract. All right, you got Mike Green out in Washington. He is struggling over in Washington. A few years ago, this guy was a stud. He was your number one defenseman over there. He's now like your sixth defenseman over there. He's got a good right-handed shot. The guy can power, he can he can quarterback a power play, and he's an unrestricted free agent. So I don't think you have to give up as much because there's no there's there's no incentive for him staying another year. So you give up a little bit, and you get to keep him possibly. On top of it, he's your sixth. He's their sixth defenseman. What what are they really losing here? You know what I'm saying? You got Jeff Petrie from the Edmonton Oilers. He is also an unrestricted free agent. Uh, currently, he's earning just a little over three million a year. I like him. I think he could be a nice addition. Again, you're only giving up a little bit because there's not he's there's no nothing to tie him to this organization later on. So you give up maybe a prospect, maybe a draft pick, something later in the rounds, and I think you can get him. Same thing with with Zidlicki out of New Jersey. He's another uh, pending unrestricted free agent. His cap hits a little bit more expensive than Petrie's. It's four million, but again, these guys you don't have to give up a ton to get them. And they're going to help you. They're nice right-handed shots. They'll sit through the quarterback, your power play, and that's what they're looking for. They're not looking to add too much more on the offensive end, but they're looking to really fill out that back half. And that's it, that's where I think they go. I think they go out and I think they target those four guys. If you look at the Red Wings' needs, you could tell they need a top-pairing defender, maybe a scoring right winger, top four defenseman who is a stay-at-home defenseman, and maybe they might need a goaltender, but you never know. They, I doubt they'll ever make a move by trading Howard or trading the monster at this point in time and who's really out there. There hasn't been a whole hell of a lot of talk, but fantasy land, you trade Jimmy Howard for another <laughs> hot goaltender that can lead us to the promised land. But no, I agree with you. Keith Yandel would be a great fit. A lot of rumors, a lot of speculation has the Red Wings linked with Dion Phaneuf from the Maple Leafs. It's not going to happen. I think his contract status, yeah, will make it really difficult. But His contract status plus his left-handed shot. Yeah. There's but, no way they go get him. You don't think so? You don't think Toronto may be in dump mode right now trying to... Oh, like Toronto's, looking, Toronto's looking to get whatever they can get, and they're trying to build for the future. Brendan Shanahan's doing nice things over there because he's just trying to acquire picks and just move salary. But I don't think I don't think the Wings go out because he's got six years and seven million left on his contract. You know, a seven million dollar cap hit for the next six years. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, but... Plus, think, he's a left-handed shot. You don't yeah, need that. Yeah, it's true. But the, the challenge is you look at a Kyle Quincy of Brendan Smith and a Jonathan Erickson, they're not exactly in the roles that they need to be. So you bring in a Dion Phaneuf and you can move those guys into the roles that they're slotted. And so you instantly upgrade the defense. So that's why I think the wings are linked to a Dion Phaneuf. Yeah, I don't think it'll happen. Um, I think a potential move that may be good to help address a significant need, Cam Atkinson, a scoring right winger from Columbus, is a guy that can come in just in case there's a fall off in offense. He could be a second line uh, scorer and he's on pace to finish around 20 goals. So, you know, he's a guy that I've targeted, a guy that I've liked to watch uh, over there at Columbus. Cam Atkinson could be a guy that could add some depth. But I think, you know, my thinking regarding the wings at the trade deadline, I don't think they're going to make a significant move. I think that Ken Holland may be giving us a little bit of spin. I just think that what big move out there could they make? What general manager is going to help power the Red Wings to win the Stanley Cup. Unless they give up Paul Kinnan or Anthony Mantha, then you know, then a GM may say, oh, okay. But other than that, I don't think the Red Wings can swindle another general manager at this point in time. So that's why 
I don't think a major move is going to happen. But a question I want to ask you is... be a blockbuster is, deal, dude. I'm telling you. You feel it? You got, there's going to be a blockbuster. You feel deal. something creeping? Yeah, there's going to be something. There's, okay. they, there's going to. They've been quiet for too long. There's already been a lot of big names that have fallen, gone off the board. And they've been quiet for a few years, especially at trade deadline, which is really weird as a Red Wing fan. Because like you said, growing up, that was like Christmas. It was, if you were an NHL fan, if you were a Red Wing fan, that was your Christmas day. It was like, ooh, what are we going to get today? What are we going to get? What are we going to get? I mean, I remember when Chris Chelios got brought in. I remember when Paul Coffey got brought in. I remember those interviews when those dudes were getting off the bus and walking into the stadium. I remember those. And they were so exciting. So exciting. No doubt a guy like Rick Nash would be a Red Wing. Um, with all his prowess and power, you know a guy like Rick Nash. We would have bought him. We would have bought a bunch of other high-talented players. Seven years ago, yeah. yeah. Eight years ago. But not anymore. Can't do it. Taylor cap. But, Taylor not, cap. but the Wings have adapted. Okay, we want to go younger. It took them a little while to get that nudge and to get these guys in, in the lineup, but they've gone younger and they've had success. You, you would think with a young team that they would have more years struggling to get to the playoffs. Last year was a struggle, but the experience that the young players got made you think, man, had they been in there earlier, had they been in the system, had they been in the NHL lineups earlier, what could they have done? But all credit, no, I give all credit to the organization, the scouting department. You got to keep giving them credit because the Red Wings are on are looking good for the future. But this season, I think they have to make a blockbuster move in order to make a deep run. So that's why right now it's such an interesting time for the Wings because they are, in my opinion, one superstar, one key impact player away from making that deep run. But can they get them? I don't think so. They need to. They need to. The way things are now with this young team, this Red Wing team needs to make a big move in order to get over the hump. The Eastern Conference is tough with a lot of size, teams that are going to go after the Wings in the playoffs. Right now, the Wings are positioning themselves well. But you look at teams like Montreal, you look at teams like Philadelphia, the Rangers, huge teams. And they're not going to just let the Wings, you know, skate around, do the European-style hockey. They're going to go after the Wings, and they're going to slam them. So I don't want to see a situation where a team is dominating us physically. That's funny because I feel the complete opposite way. I don't think they have to make a move to make a deep run at Say all. Say what? I don't think I, I don't I don't believe they have to. I think they have enough firepower with their offensive talent that they have right now. Even with Hank Zetterberg injured and I'm saying he has a concussion, even dealing with that, and I think even having 87 left-handed shots on your back half uh, back half of your line. I still think they have enough talent to make a deep run. All you need in playoff hockey is a hot goaltender. That's all you need. And I know we've killed Jimmy Howard and we've crucified him on this program a numerous times. Numerous times. All you need is a hot goalie, though. And I know we crucified Jimmy Howard on this program, but I think he's playing better than he played last year. And I just, I just feel like Jimmy Howard's playing better. And I know that I'm nitpicking when I say I want him to fine tune what he's doing because I just want, the, I want the best for this team. So I think all you need is a hot goaltender, and you can make a deep run. If you look at the Red Wings and you look at their recent exits in the playoffs you can kind of see now that this Eastern Conference is going to be a lot more difficult to get out of the East than it was the West. And the West was super tough. Right now, the teams in the East are ferocious. They play a different brand of hockey. And while it's great in that the Wings don't have to travel as much, the style of play, can these guys stay with it? Can can this group of young, talented players rise to another level needed in the playoffs? And you said it yourself. All the parts of the game have to be clicking at the right time. Offense, defense, Jimmy Howard. I think that this team maybe needs a needs a little bit of a shot. Look at the Pistons. They added a young player, Reggie Jackson, and they look excited. They look enthusiastic, and they're ready to take off. I think more psycho. I'm, I'm thinking psychologically right now with the addition of a big you player. Would be. Yeah, I'm thinking psychologically. I'm thinking, you know what? Right now, the Wings are at that fine line of okay, what should we do to keep this roster together? and progressing into the future, but they're playing so well this season. You got to remember, cuz we went into the season thinking this team may struggle to get into the playoffs. This season, the way they're performing has been an overall surprise. So right now, Ken Holland and Mike Babcock have to decide, okay, should we potentially throw our chips all in and take that gamble and get someone here to go to the next level? They need to do that. It's very rare that you have a chance to have success in sports. And when you sense it and when you feel it, I feel it. You know, you watch these games, they get down by two goals, they give up two or three, they come back. This team has that it special factor. So why not add a one or two more pieces, make that run? The only person I would not trade, the only player I would not trade is Mantha. Everything else is on the table I would consider. 
If they want to make that blockbuster move, if it involves Mantha, you don't do it. You risk going only to the second round, still progressing, and then reevaluating next season because this team has a wealth of young talent still in the minors that haven't even cracked the lineup yet. If it doesn't involve Mantha, any combination of trades I would listen to and I would seriously consider bolstering this team because this team with one or two more scoring pieces and one or two more defensemen that can help this current lineup out could take this team where we're at the early summer holding up a Stanley Cup. Yeah, I think Kenny's got something in the works, man. I firmly believe he's got something going on that he's not letting on about. I think he's had some discussions about a few guys, and I think they're just trying to fine-tune a deal here. And I think on trade deadline day, there's going to be a big move. I believe it, dude. I just there, There's got to be something. They've played too well. Too many young kids up here. Too many young kids doing a lot of great things. I think, I think there'll be a move to be made. It'll be a piece that's going to stick with this team for a season or two, and it'll help us. It'll help elevate this team to a cup contender. Yeah, good stuff, cuz. Great podcast. Episode number 81, wrapping this bad boy up. Thanks to everyone that downloads this podcast. Thanks to everyone that's supporting us. Now, support both shows, the Motor City Sports Rant and the Doc and Jock program on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. We're only growing this thing bigger, baby. More downloads, more shows, more interactive. We want to be more interactive with you on Twitter, Facebook, taking phone calls. So help us continue to provide great sports content here at the podcast by visiting our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com, and click through those banner links and contribute financially via PayPal. We would greatly appreciate it. For the jock, Adam Strozinski, give him credit. He powered through this. He tried to do the best he could being under the weather. He still showed up. 81 episodes strong. Still kicking, man. Every single week, every Thursday, you know it. You expect it. Doc and Jock will be on the internet airwaves. For the Jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the Doc, John Macaroon. This has been the Doc and Jock program, episode 81 in the books. Go Pistons, go Wings. I'm sports before chicks all day long. It's just kind of how I roll. So, and hey, Ange, what's up, girl? Damn! There's something wrong with me.